Seymour from Justice Solutions, and uh, I think Melissa Hook is also on the call from Justice Solutions. And I wanted to thank Melissa because she arranged all the logistics. Um, the folks we have on, I believe, are all the members that are uh, that remain um, that are living, and that is Doris Dolan, Ken Eikenberry, Judge Haight. Uh, General Meese, can't thank you enough for joining us. Uh, Governor Miller, Dr. Robertson, uh, Dr. Staminow, and we even got your fabulous staff person, Terry Russell. So that is who Oh, wow. <laughs> After <laughs> that many years, I think it's a miracle. <laughs> so if we just decided that I am going to um, uh, try to take the bull a little bit by the horns and ask the questions of specific people. And also, I've already apologized in advance to folks if I need to to cut people off because we really need to have as uh, concise of answers as possible because of time limitations. All right. Okay. So, Lois, do you mind if I start with you? No. Oh, good. Um, what was your understanding, Lois, of the mission and goals of the President's Task Force? Well, I think this followed on the Violent Crime Task Force and the concern they had that victims of crime were not being treated well in the system. And really the mission and the goal uh, as created by uh, – Ed Meese, who's on this line, I think was to find out how are they being treated and what can we do to improve their treatment if we find they're not treated well. I mean, it wasn't a, a, a total understanding that they weren't treated well, badly. We just had to find out. It was very exploratory. How are they being treated and then what would, what would we recommend given our findings? Great. General Meese? <clears throat> well, I think uh, Lois has summed it up very well. And I, particularly, I'd like to emphasize the fact that it did follow on the study on violent crime. Uh, particularly, the president was interested in finding out what the federal government could do, recognizing that uh, law enforcement and dealing with the crime is primarily a state and local responsibility, but it was to look and see what uh, might be done at the federal level, and also to provide information that could then be picked up at the state and local level by uh, people there, which, in fact, is what happened. Didn't know that. That's great. Um, Governor Miller, what's your take on this? Uh, it was a practical exercise, I think, because uh, from a prosecutorial vantage point, it become evident that many cases were being lost due to the reticence of, of witnesses and participation, witnesses and victims. And at least the exercise we went through established why, uh, that they were treated impersonally, uh, that they were given less rights than the defendant, uh, and they they felt uh, disenfranchised from the system, and so I think that the review enabled us to ascertain number one where the problems were, and number two how to correct them. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Robertson. Please. Well, I I follow along with what the others have said, but uh, the thing that struck me so much as we were entering into this was the fact of revictimization that the that the system was actually victimizing the victims and. That, that came through so clearly uh, all the way up and down the line from the earlier impact of a, of a crime to the sentencing to the parole that somehow the victims were, were not considered uh, appropriate uh, you know, wards of the, of the system. And uh, I, I think the role of the task force was to bring forth those things to some very comprehensive hearings. We, as you know, traveled all over the country taking testimony uh, getting anecdotal evidence and hearing from experts, and I believe uh, we gathered sufficient information to put down a very uh, sizable body of, uh, of uh, findings. Yes, you did indeed. Thank you for that. Uh, Terry Russell, from the staff perspective. Yes, um, I'd like to say first, it's very interesting. Uh, I had uh, been the staff person on the Attorney General's Task Force on Violent Crime that um, handled the victims area. That one, as you recall, was I think Jeff Harris was the executive director and it was overseen by Rudy Giuliani. And um, so that's, as has been indicated, that's exactly what we found out, that they weren't being handled well and so forth. Uh, I think from, from our standpoint uh, with the staff, we were sort of focused on really two major goals. Uh, one was to come up, well, first, you know, to find out what in fact was happening. I mean, that's the key thing there. But based and building on that, to come up with recommendations, number one, that could help make the victim as whole as possible after the victimization. And then secondly, as um, was just said, to help prevent secondary victimization by the system. Right. 
Thank you, Terry. Uh, Dr. Salmonow, please. Yes, I came to the task force really knowing very little about uh, the victim or the psychology of the victim because my specialty was the psychology of the criminal. So I was very familiar with the rights and services that were accorded to the criminal. And certainly uh, in, this, uh, in the task force hearings, the out of balance of the scales of justice just struck me over and over and over again. So yes, I certainly concur with the organization that the task force mission was learning about how out of balance uh, the system was and what could be done. And one other observation is that um, people in the mental health field, and of course I'm a psychologist, we knew very little about victims and there was essentially no training whatsoever in how to deal with victims of crime. Uh -huh. And that was actually one of your recommendations, as I recall, focusing on the mental health profession. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's great. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Doris Dolan. Uh, yes. Uh, I hope I'm not repeating uh, what was been said, but uh, sometimes you can hear about things or read it in the newspaper or even watch it on TV, but the only way you really find out is to have the uh, people who have suffered as victims to come and testify in person, and then from that you get the real feeling of the horrible suffering that they went through and what we had to do to try to balance the system out. Um, and uh, if I may talk later, I know you want to go through them, but uh, from this conference I uh, took on two, three projects. Uh, one was I was on a hospital board, so I um, developed a victims of a crisis center at a hospital, which was a model, and it was passed on then to many hospitals, but it needs more embellishment. It really does. So the more hospitals are using it. And um, the other was to involve uh, corporations um, uh, in uh, victims of crime, giving them time off for uh, um, understanding what they are going through uh, because many of them didn't and uh, so those are two things that I, I did to um, uh, to beef up uh, the recommendations that came from this. That's great Doris. Now if you want one more, so I we worked for years on the exclusionary rule. It knows that from our conferences and uh, that was one thing that kept us from giving uh, any understanding to what the victim was going through because it was just not part of the criminal justice system. And uh, we put in a U.S. Supreme Court decision and uh, with Lance versus Gates, and finally we did uh, um, <laughs> maneuver some kind of an understanding to help on the exclusionary rule. And Ed, what has happened exactly on the exclusionary rule now? Well, Doris, actually, we, we I would love to get off onto that, but that's not on our questions. I've really got to keep us on point today. Okay. And and, uh, and as I mentioned to you, I'm going to do a more in-depth interview with you later on all of the work that you did afterwards, but I've got to keep a really tight schedule. I do apologize. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, Last but not least on this question, mission and goals. General Eikenberry, please. I think we started on the uh, presumption that the system wasn't operating fairly, so our mission was to uh, take the available data and identify the defects and then make particular recommendations uh, for correcting them. My personal motivation was that we needed to upgrade the legal status of victims and uh, rebalance the whole system so that there was a, a similar focus for victims as was already granted to defendants. Wow. Upgrade the legal status. Thank you. That's very, very good. Um, the, the next question, I think I'll start with General Meese, if I may. As, as you went through the task force process, did the mission or their goals or any of your strategies change or evolve um, in any way? <clears throat> well, I wasn't actually on the task force but was uh, trying to be helpful in the White House. But I think uh, one of the things that uh, did come out of the various hearings was that the uh, problems of victims were more widespread than had originally been anticipated, and that it really applied, as their recommendations ultimately said, uh, to not only police prosecutors, judiciary, 
uh, parole boards and those directly involved in the system, but there were a lot of recommendations for other organizations like uh, hospitals, the ministry, uh, the legal profession, uh, schools, mental health community, and the like, so that it really was much broader, I think, at the conclusion of the project than uh, many people had thought at the start. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Governor Miller. Yes. Do you think anything changed in terms of the mission or goals over the, the process of the task force? I think it broadened, uh, and you've heard from some of the other members that they brought their particular areas of expertise, uh, whether it was enhanced law enforcement, psychological community development, corporate involvement, all of which have been mentioned moments ago, uh, into recognition that the, the scope of the problem uh, was more pervasive than anybody had originally anticipated that there was a complete disenfranchisement, that we had treated victims somewhat like uh, inanimate objects to be present uh, to say their piece and to be removed from the process, and that that couldn't continue uh, in our society, that they had to be treated uh, with respect, uh, involvement, and certainly with tremendous input uh, for the system to uh, be effective, as well as basically just to give them the rights that uh, they should be in an hour uh, able to uh, obtain. Yeah, and, when, and, and toward the end we will talk about now and the progress that's been made. I appreciate that. Dr. Robertson, any changes that you observed through the process? Well, I think the thing that uh, really uh, uh, crystallized my thinking and somewhat shocked me was a bold statement that the committee advocated for a constitutional amendment, which I, I thought was the was the ultimate. It unfortunately hasn't gone through yet, but the idea that victims would be included uh, as a constitutional right that, that during trials that their their concerns and their presence would, would be mandated at criminal trials. And I, I think uh, this was the ultimate that we brought forth. In my particular uh, field, there were, there were many of them, but of course uh, the one having to do with the uh, police chaplaincy of how significant that was uh, uh, for the um, health of victims, if somebody who was compassionate could come alongside of them at the time, but also how harmful certain of this uh, counseling was when it wasn't uh, directed appropriately by people who understood the problem. So it was, uh, I think we made recommendations dealing with that. Back today. Um, Terry Russell, what are your thoughts on the process changing at all? I think similar. I think. What we found out was that the scale was so out of balance in, in favor of the defendant and not with the victim, and that uh, the magnitude of the problem was so great that it really um, required the coordinated effort of all sectors of society. It, this wasn't just a criminal justice issue. This involved all sectors of society. Great. Well put. Thank you. Dr. Samenow. Yeah, you know what I think? I think that the victim actually was an abstraction, at least to me, when we began the proceedings. And I agree with Doris Dolan when she said there is nothing like hearing from a victim himself or herself to really hear the layers and layers and layers of harm. So for me, and I think really in a way for the task force, that the the multi-challenge, the multi-layers, of the multi-dimensions of this made us embrace more and more fields and areas that we saw were deficient. That's great. Thank you. Doris Dolan, please. Uh, yes, I want to uh, say something about the, uh, the medical and what has been done for us in the way of research and that wonderful woman who died at such an early age uh, who really uh, brought about the discovery of DNA. And uh, as a helpmate to what we are, we tried to do and didn't have then access was uh, the use of DNA because I used to sit and listen to witnesses and then what they were saying in the court, and there was no way for a woman uh, or a man uh, to uh, find justice until DNA made it a certainty. Uh, do you agree with me, uh, Lois, on that? Well, it certainly helped. <laughs> yeah. Huh? yeah. It certainly Thanks. helped. <laughs> it didn't it help? <laughs> yes. uh, thank you, Doris. Yes. Um, Ken Eikenberry, did the, the process change at all as you went through the task force? Yes, it did. Um, I'd have to say the 
the biggest change for me was that I frankly was shocked at how little I had understood what happens to a victim. And I, uh, in answering your question, I <laughs> resorted to a law review article that appeared uh, in uh, Wayne Law Review in 1987, which I wrote at their request. We remember. And I had pointed out that I had been a uh, an investigator with the federal government. I'd been a deputy prosecuting attorney in our here in Washington State. Uh, I'd been an attorney general, and yet, after working with all of these victims, I really had not uh, comprehended what what happens to them, what they go through, how their life changes forever in so many instances, and uh, it. Uh, it, for me, it put a whole new light on the significance of the problem and even more determination, I think, to, to change it. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move on to another question. This time I'd like to start with Governor Miller. This question really is, is how did you collect the data? How did you um, gather the information that contributed to the report? And if any of you has a favorite story or a, a, a favorite witness or something that was very compelling, this would be a good place to share that with us. Governor Miller, we'll start with you. Well, of course, we had testimony from numerous witnesses uh, which were uh, brought forth by the staff, by our chairman, and then with some input from those of us who were members. I know that one witness that I had encouraged to participate, which whose testimony was and continues to be particularly impactive with John Walsh, whom I'd met uh, in my role as district attorney and who was the uh, father of a missing murdered child and who has uh, led a lot of efforts thereafter in dealing uh, in this issue. Uh, but as impactive as he was, there were less notable witnesses uh, that were equally uh, important in bringing forth uh, their individualized stories as to uh, what they'd encountered and, and what had made them feel that the system wasn't treating them fairly. And I think it was a compilation of all that uh, coupled with, as I said, the experiences of each of us that ultimately led to the recommendations reaching beyond strict law enforcement into the private sector, in, into uh, the involvement uh, of the whole life of the, of the victim and, and all the elements, the psychological static there, the financial and, and uh, all full impact, and I, I think that's what ultimately led to all of them, and of course the most far-reaching was the, the prospect of a constitutional amendment, I think, which in large part I think was a statement, because I recall that didn't make a statement that strong, yeah. uh, that the, the rest of our issues might just be put on a shelf somewhere, and we needed to make a very strong statement whether or not it would pass uh, and uh, I suspect that's at least part of the motivation of the, the Constitution Amendment provision. Great. Thank you. A really nice introduction to this question. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Robertson, what's your take on the process of collecting the information and data? The uh, one that stands out in my mind perhaps more vividly than any other, and there were so many testimonies that uh, I do remember, but I recall in New England uh, there uh, was a couple who had come to America from Great Britain. They uh, had come to this as the land of hope and opportunity, had started a little business, begun to uh, gain a certain amount of financial uh, security in this country. Uh, their home was broken into. They were brutally beaten and uh, uh, crippled for life. Uh, and I, as I recall, it was one of the more tragic examples of somebody who had come to these shores hoping for something better and then had become victims of crime. And uh, that one stands out in my mind. Uh, the other uh, that struck me was the uh, treatment of rape victims, the uh, uh, impersonality, the fact that the, uh, a rape victim would have to sit on benches along uh, close by the rapist and 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 be subjected to uh, indignities uh, from the moment of uh, of the uh, examination all the way through. Not to mention the fact that they had to pay their own medical bills. So this this to me was uh, just a horrible example again of that revictimization. But the, the one of that the 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 uh, most vivid to me was that middle-aged couple from England who who whose lives had been totally shattered by an unknown assailant uh, in. Uh, I believe it was Massachusetts. 
Thank you, Dr. Robertson. That's, that's very, 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 very touching when you hear specific examples. Um, Terry Russell, and I know you did a lot of the synthesizing of the data, so have at it, Terry. Okay. Let me, to describe the process that we used at the staff level, I think, you know, we started off uh, first with oh, a number of meetings with Lois uh, in, in helping to plan this. Lois was just uh, really instrumental in, in helping to, to put our, our process in, into place. Uh, you know, we, we talked about which cities should we hold hearings in. And, and when that was decided, <clears throat> we then had, you know, we had a very small staff, but uh, I assigned uh, our staff to each of the cities, and then they um, made the connections with uh, uh, local authorities and the key people in those cities, um, and then they actually went out and, and interviewed potential witnesses. Um, as you can imagine, there were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of potential witnesses, and a large part of what we did at the staff level was first to sort of divide um, this whole broad area into specific issue uh, areas. And, um, you know, what are the key issues that we would like to take a look at? And, and then look for sort of the best witnesses that would help to elucidate um, those particular areas. We wanted to, we didn't want to have, you know, witness after witness and, and a lot of just um, redundancy and repetition and so forth, but really have pick witnesses that could really focus on the key issues and, and the key areas with a story to tell, and it would hopefully give some light that would lead toward a resolution. Um, and, and so that's how the hearings were set up. Uh, we had a lot of help at the local level in, in identifying these witnesses, and then we selected them um, first on the issue areas and secondly on the sectors, because at that time we realized that it wasn't just the criminal justice system. It was uh, also um, the ministry and, and the mental health and, and so forth. So we tried to um, pick witnesses that would help um, shed light on, on the sector areas as well. Uh, and, then, and then we went out and, and held the hearings and collected the information and presented it to the task force. Wow. Th thank you, Terry. That was a really nice overview. Um, Dr. Samenow. Yeah, I think to follow along with what uh, Terry said, um, it is or, or, or was certainly the witnesses with the story to tell. And I think that one of the uh, findings that, that we uh, saw repeatedly, unfortunately, was that the victim often felt put on trial, especially, as Pat Robertson pointed out, with respect to sexual assaults. It was almost as though the victim had played a role uh, in causing his or her own victimization. Wow. And uh, the stories that were told indicated that in many ways the costs never ended, uh, and I don't mean just the dollar costs. So, uh, but I think that, that really what we kept hearing and hearing and kept asking about was the victim being put on trial. Right. Thank you very much. Doris Stolen. Uh, well, I would um, like to just revert back uh, with um, uh, the one that uh, I, I have never forgotten, and I'll make this short, but it was a young, very handsome man uh, who um, uh, practiced uh, his uh, instrument at night at a place, you know, so he could be in an orchestra, and he came home and he was stabbed, I think for $2 they found out in his pocket, and, um, and that would be bad enough, but he was never able to blow the horn again because it uh, affected his chest and he couldn't um, get the breath to do it. It's things like that that just stay vivid in your mind and make you determined you're going to continue with this work until we get some of these problems solved. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doris. Uh, General Eikenberry. Well, as to the process, I particularly recall the uh, charge, I think it was from our then chair, now Judge Height, uh, saying that we were not going to create any new data, but rather we were going to simply collect the data that was already out there from people who had been on the field and worked with victims and that sort of thing, and that's exactly what happened as others have described it. All right, thank you so much. Well, uh, let me just uh, comment that... Uh, I was, uh, again, struck by the lingering effects of crime that hadn't been spelled out as to how these traumatic events 
uh, create uh, a fight or flee uh, attitude on the part of victims that will per uh, perplex them for the rest of their lives. And I recall as a deputy prosecutor interviewing a rape victim with the idea that I had to, uh, as you might say, toughen that vic uh, toughen them up as a witness. And I was embarrassed to uh, uh, to then realize what I that I hadn't understood what was happening with that victim. So and I think this plays into the, a comment on today's society where a callous uh, regard for violence is so evident in all kinds of media displays, and what we do about that I don't know, except we need to recognize, I think, that it is <coughs> engendering a, a worse problem. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of developing the final recommendations, Dr. Robertson, would you like to start us off on that? And I, I guess what I'm getting at, too, is I know you had categories, but there were so many recommendations in so many diverse categories. How did that all happen? Well, uh, first of all, I have to congratulate the staff. The staff of this committee was just tremendous, and uh, Lois's leadership was uh, exemplary. I think uh, uh, she pulled together and the staff pulled together some diverse elements that I think was, were extraordinarily commendable. But when we got through, the recommendations were very clearly for uh, action items at the federal and state level. I think they were very concisely expressed, and the, the, I'm sure there were model statutes that came out of this as well. Of course, the ultimate was the constitutional amendment that hasn't yet come about, but I, I think that the draft of the, of the recommendations were for specific action. This was not a general statement of, isn't this a terrible problem we should do something about? These were actions about, this is what you can do with parole, this is what you can do with, in terms of restraining criminals, this is what you can do to give victims treatment, and this is what the private sector can do as well. So I, I, I think the, the organization of, uh, of the findings were absolutely superb, and they, of course, followed right out of the testimony that we all received. Right. Thank you. Um, let's see, Terry Russell, uh, a fabulous staff. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I do have to say, I think that uh, Lois was so key. Usually the chair, um, you know, has a, has a chair role that helps bring the, the uh, board members to, to so forth. Lois worked really full time and worked directly with the staff, and she was extremely uh, instrumental in all of this. But what we did was we went through the... Um, the issue areas uh, and through through the um, different sectors of society and so forth, wanting to get a, a broad based um, really a, a mandate, a suggested mandate that could go out that could really make a difference. And, and we used a litmus test: Will this change for the benefit of the victim? Um, how they're treated, how they recover, uh, and so forth. So we, each recommendation that we used in the different issue areas and the different sectors of society had to meet that test. And we narrowed it down um, to the ones that we have. Uh, and, and that was, I'm, you know, I'm sure in connection with a number of discussions with the task force, and, and then we put together a number of drafts that went through and, and continually got task force uh, uh, input on this and so forth, and, and uh, they were changed along the course of this and, and finally adopted. And I think that the implementation of these recommendations across the country just shows how focused they were, and I think they made a tremendous difference. And I'm uh, carrying a, a follow up question, which others also can answer uh, as your time comes. Um, for some of these um, entities, it was the first time that anyone had said anything to them about obligations to victims. Was that, uh, was that, surprising to some of these folks out in the field who were now, there were recommendations that said you have obligations to victims. Absolutely. I think that uh, they hadn't even looked at it that way. And it was, I think Stanton said it very well for the um, mental health community. And, and we, when we went out, we found um, many people that were basically focused on how best to help the, the assailant. And then when the victim came in, it was a question of, talking to the victim about how they were treated as a child by their parents or something, you know, not focused on the victimization. And we found that as we went out that they really hadn't realized it. Great. Thank you. Dr. Stamina, anything to add on that? Well, all I can say is that uh, Lois uh, 
led uh, the, the task force and the staff into a frontier that um, there were so many wide-ranging specific recommendations because the neglect of victims at all levels, at, in all phases, from the time they were victimized until afterwards was so appalling that there was almost no end to the number of areas which cried for recommendations. So it sounds like it, would, it was hard to willow it down to the, the 60 some recommendations that you ended up having. Well, I, I think that I don't know how hard it was in the end, um, but all I can say is we had just massive and massive amounts of information and uh, there was neglect at every phase from the time of the crime until long afterwards. So, yeah, I mean, there had to be a lot that was very, very specific. Thank you so much. Uh, Doris Dolan, please. Uh, yes, I have a question, and I hope this is not off of your agenda, but they were such a beautiful job of outlining all of those areas, as Lois and Terry have mentioned. Um, but uh, what I would like to know is, are we going to be able to add to uh, this uh, task force of uh, things that have now become um, very obvious? And um, we had a conference on the victimization through use of fraudulent documents. And now that we have home security as being such a um, upfront subject on everyone's mind, um, could we add, add, add to, I'm asking, if that is not covered and I couldn't find it, uh, what happened? Because we we found out that the use of fraudulent documents was allowing a lot of people to come in and, and use the services and uh, right. do harm. You see yeah. what I mean? Uh, I'm going to have to. I have to jump in. Uh, it's a great topic, but not on my agenda for today. Okay. Something that I think maybe you and I need to talk about afterwards when I do our follow-up interview. Okay. Is that okay? Sure. Great. Um, Ken Eikenberry, in terms of the final recommendations, any insights there? Well, yes. As uh, has been mentioned, you could see that there were uh, recommendations being developed and kept track of by staff and others on the committee or on the task force, uh, so I reverted to a uh, to the point of asking every judge, every professor, every law-trained professional that uh, testified to the committee about the uh, potential effectiveness of a constitutional amendment to uh, guarantee uh, rights of victims of crime. And um, as, I, to, as I recall, every one of them uh, agreed or affirmed that that this would be a positive change that would uh, really uh, get at, in a fundamental way, all of the recommendations that might uh, be thought of. So uh, anyway, that was laying the foundation. I think we, I started asking those questions about the second hearing, and uh, it did lay a good foundation for our final recommendation in that respect. All right, and we'll, we're going to talk a little more in depth about that a little bit later. Um, Judge Hayton, I'm sorry I skipped you on the last question, so you just answer whatever comes to mind. <laughs> well, Come first of all, in, Lois. <laughs> you have to understand what a thrill it is to hear these voices. <laughs> I mean, when I hear Bob and Ken and Terry and Stanton and Pat, I mean, and Doris, the memories that come are just incredible. The work of this task force, their sensitivity, they never, ever missed a task force. I don't think hardly anybody did. They never missed a meeting. They were intelligent, intuitive, brought the resources of their background, and I just, I just had to say that. I'm just kind of overwhelmed listening to them and bringing back the memories of these marvelous people that cared so much about their fellow man and woman. I think it's, uh, and Ed, who was part of the creation of this, uh, it's just an incredible experience to hear. But I, as some of the issues, I think one of the issues that struck me the most uh, frankly, was the mental health aspect of it, because, as been mentioned briefly, we, you know, the criminal got the psychiatrist or the psychologist, but most of the times the victims never did. And uh, then when they got them, they were, you know, as Terry said, they were going back to, well, how did your mother treat you? Not how the impact of crime was on the victim. So I think that was an incredible uh, revelation, as well as the hospitals, employers, and ministries, and schools 
that the goals did change because we did slip away from just criminal justice and realized everybody was blaming or mistreating the victims. Another issue that came to mind is, and you ask how did we kind of get there in some of our testimony, we had some outstanding help, and I think that should be acknowledged. And Marlene Young and John Stein and Nova, uh, Ed Stout out of Indiana, Harriet Salerno out of San Francisco, Karen McLaughlin, Jim Rowland, and another issue that came up from us that I don't think any of us even focused on was I remember being McPherson out of Colorado when you all remember talking about molesters and the fact they were getting like five days in county jail for molesting five or six or ten children. Oh, there's just so many people that we owe a great debt of gratitude. Those victims that risked uh, a lot of embarrassment and publicity that they didn't want to inform us, and those that were working in the victim's field uh, that cared so much and helped helped us, Lucy Friedman in New York, um, Harold Boscovich, Veronica Zucchini. I'm just thinking of some of these names. I was writing them down as we're talking. Edith Sergan, uh, Betty Jane Spencer, who mm-hmm. had probably one of the most uh, horrific stories any of us heard when her four sons were killed uh, and how she was left for dead and that none of uh, the, all her assailants were, were caught, but she received no help whatsoever and there were assailants were all in prison, studying, one a lawyer. They were you know, getting their housing, et cetera, and it was quite a traumatic Okay, Lois? Yeah? Okay, sorry, we had a little static there. All right, so, I mean, I just, those are some of my thoughts. I think there's some outstanding people that should get a lot of credit for this because they really helped gather the people that we that informed us because we couldn't go out and do it all. And, of course, Terry Russell just did an excellent job in our staff and also helping to, to bring some of these people to light to inform us about some of the horrific problems. I don't, the, the basic themes that they were blamed, that I think was pretty appalling to all of us. The basic themes that they were ignored in the system for continuances and parole hearings and and by judges, I think that was pretty appalling. And the mistreatment of them, I think, was pretty appalling. And I think we really focused on on those basic issues of treating them better, uh, making them whole if possible, helping them mentally, um, and really, as has been said, balancing the criminal justice system for the first time. Great. Thank you, Los. And we will make sure that we um, credit everyone who you just mentioned. I appreciate your doing that. Um, General Meese, in terms of final recommendations. I think what made this report one of the most compelling that I've read of its nature was your including the statements of the various witnesses alongside the recommendations. Uh, you know, usually recommendations can get kind of legalistic in uh, what's uh, being suggested. But by having the statements of, in many cases, of victims, it gave a lot of punch to the report. And that's why I think this report was so well received. Absolutely right. Thank you for that. Um, Terry Russell, how about you starting off the next question? And if you could not, we're going to talk about the Constitutional Amendment later. So if you could talk about uh, the other ones uh, besides that. Do you think the recommendations have been fully addressed? And if they haven't been fully addressed, where do we need more help? Is the Cliff Notes version of that question? <laughs> Thank you. I've just I was tremendously impressed uh, with the way that the report was received. I think so frequently um, you have reports that are issued and then basically sit on a shelf collecting dust, and uh, not much gets done at all. Uh, this report was totally different. Uh, Two things I'd like to, re- I mean, the last I heard, and, and I know it went up, it was a number of years ago, I think 64 out of the 68 recommendations were f- implemented across the country, uh, and I suspect it's, it's probably 67 out of 68 now. I mean, it was just tremendous response, I think, was was just key. Secondly, uh, in, in following through the victim field, uh, I heard time after time all across the country that this was really the Bible for victims' rights and, and victim services. And, and years later, 
um, people were still pulling out, you know, 10 years later they were pulling out their task force report and said, you know, well, the task force said this and so forth. And, I mean, it really became a living document. And I think that that is just was so impressive in an area with, you know, folks have a tendency to be jaded about so many uh, reports being issued out of Washington. This came from the, uh, as Ed Mies said, from the, from the mouths of the victims uh, of the crime, and I think it made all the difference in the world. Great. Thank you, Terry. Dr. Salmon now, please. Well, I think that uh, one thing that really changed, uh, because I still evaluate and occasionally counsel offenders, uh, and I do appear in courtrooms, is that people who deal with offenders increasingly, although there's still a lot of way to go on this, have turned from the whys and the excuses of why the offender is the way he is, why he did what he did, to actually including in their evaluation and counseling of the offender for the offender to think about what he did to the victim, to include the victim in the counseling and to talk about the ripple effect on the victim. And so, uh, therefore, of course, there have been uh, restitution programs. And uh, so just the awareness within the community of people who work with offenders, whereas there was none before, I think that's absolutely remarkable. And there's still room to go, but it's a lot better than it was. Absolutely right. Thank you for that. Uh, Doris Dolan, please. Well, I am. Um I have to ditto what uh, the gentleman just said. Um, now that uh, there are so many groups and individuals who are aware, because of this report, of uh, what was lacking, they have stepped forward and uh, helped to make this a more humanized uh, field uh, for uh, victims of crime. And the one thing I do not know, and maybe you can answer this, um, uh, someone who's kept up with it, uh, the one thing that a victim always suffered was uh, if uh, someone was murdered or if they were injured and couldn't work, uh, the supply of money that must come to them immediately, has that been uh, addressed? I know it was asked, but... Has it been addressed uh, to help the victim immediately with with money because that's what they desperately need? It, you know, Doris, that's a great question, and it has been. Um, all 50 states now have compensation programs with emergency funds, and I'm very glad you brought that up. Oh, that's that's what I was worried about because if you have to wait or apply for funds, uh, it doesn't do you any good. What you need is the help you know, immediately, well, and I'm so glad that they have that emergency fund now. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that comment. Uh, General Eikenberry, please. Well, I would endorse uh, the comments that have been made, and then add one thing. In uh, retrospect, I wish that we had also recommended the appointment of legal counsel for victims at least as to seeking restitution. Wow. Uh, beginning at the time of, uh, perhaps beginning at the time of the sentencing phase and, and thereafter. And the thing I'm getting at here is that uh, I think that there, uh, the idea that debt is repaid by a person being in jail or prison is uh, erroneous in my view, and, and we need to establish a better ongoing sense of responsibility, and I think it could be done through uh, the, the counter to this uh, the counterpoint to this is that so many lawyers are now making careers out of suing the state uh, for <laughs> crimes that are committed by people who are supposedly under state supervision. Yeah. And in that sense, there is, I suppose, some restitution. But I, that putting this whole thing into a, uh, a different arena would sure make sense, I think. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Judge Haight, any thoughts on that? Anything missing or anything we ought to be looking at? In terms of Ken's comments on a lawyer or? Oh, no, just in general, um, do you think the recommendations have been fully realized today with all, all of your recommendations? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, when we first, I was absolutely against the constitutional amendment. I said I wanted to give the states an opportunity and, the, and everybody an opportunity to do what we recommended, and, and I have changed because I don't think they are. Continuances are still happening all the time in the system, and the victim is not talked to. 
We have all sorts of cases going forward still that the victim has had no input whatsoever into the sentencing, and they're not made aware of it. I mean, the, the list goes on. There's, it's, in, it's in the law in many places, but it's not necessarily in practice. A lot of work still needs to be done. And I think Ken's idea, I, I'm kind of against having a lawyer, but I do think because I just don't want this to be the legal, the next uh, huge boondoggle for lawyers that will take money away from victims, but I do think converting it to civil judgment as we do here in California is an important concept for helping the victims always to be able to walk into any court and get the money if, if the person has it. I just think that there's a lot of things that still have to be done in regards to education, especially, I believe, in the judiciary, because I think that many judges were appointed or simply were not sensitive to those issues, and there is nothing being taught in law schools today that I know of that even addresses the issues of victims of crime. And then, of course, I think that goes across the board for doctors and nurses and all those in other fields that would have contact. I think the most progressive has been law enforcement. I think that they have, the sheriffs and the uh, police have absolutely been incredible in responding well to the training and to the issue. And as many said, you know, this is the reason they got into this in the first place, to help innocent people, and they have uh, done well with that. But I think the training needed to go in other areas is still very, very high. Great. Thank you, Lois. As passionate as ever, huh? Um, Let's see, General Meese, any thoughts on recommendations? Well, I think that uh, I think Lois is right uh, that uh, the police have picked it up. One thing I'd emphasize, though, it has to be continued in their training programs because you have new officers coming in all the time, and uh, the momentum has to be kept up in the training programs. Uh, but uh, I think that the, the, of all the studies that I've seen in the field of criminal justice, I think that the recommendations here have been more uh, uh, have been more fully applied than uh, most of the other uh, task forces that have reported. Good point. I appreciate that. On that high note, I am going to regretfully have to take my leave. It has been a pleasure and a privilege talking to you all again, and it sure brings back a lot of good memories. Sure, I have to catch a plane. Thanks, Diane. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bless you. Uh, okay. Where was I? Uh, Governor Miller. Well, I think uh, the essence of all the recommendations have been largely enacted across the country. But you know, keep in mind, although this was a national uh, and presidential scope, uh, the ultimate implementation, for the most part, is at the local level because most crimes uh, are prosecuted and, and occur in individual jurisdictions. And so the efforts to finalize this were uh, a multi-year process because of the fact that they had to be enacted uh, in individual states and in some cases individual cities and counties. Uh, most states uh, enacted Victim Bill of Rights, uh, but again, that process uh, took many more years than any of us would have liked to have seen. And in the course of each of those, I think there were gaps in, in the interpretations or the desires of particular jurisdictions. So uh, I think this, these results were as pervasive on a nationwide level as you can get, considering the fact that you can't just go in and enact a nationwide law or a nationwide recommendation uh, that has to be enacted uh, before it's uh, pursued by all these individual interpretations. And so I, I think... Uh, uh, largely, it's, it's there, but there's always room for refining it, and as several of the members have pointed out, uh, it was 21 years later, and frankly, some people don't necessarily pay attention, uh, and you can easily slip back into some of the mistakes that were previously made without reminders, and uh, I think uh, uh, this is a good step in that direction, but there's always a need to refine the criminal justice system and refine it with an eye toward the victim. That's great. Thank you so much. And uh, before Ed has to leave, um, uh, and Lois is going to stick with us, but I want to say to Lois and Ed, and of course I wish we could talk to our uh, wonderful president, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, I don't think any of this would have transpired 
if we hadn't had a very competent person to move into that chair, which was Lois uh, Haight. But it was our president and Ed Meese who was always behind all of these uh, programs going from the governorship up to the president. If we hadn't had that uh, behind us, this task force would never have come into being, and none of these recommendations or people involved would have transpired. So the debt of gratitude, I just want to say here before Ed or Lois has to leave us, we are so indebted. Great. Thank you, Doris. That is so sweet and, and uh, such a uh, true statement. Um, Dr. Robertson, I want to make sure you get to answer the question. Um, have the recommendations been fully addressed or if there's anything that you think might have been missing back in 82? Well, I, I think the question was there was a cry in the society for uh, some remedy. It was a perceived need all across the board. That's why the recommendations of this task force have, have found virtually universal acceptance. There's been almost no criticism of these recommendations because they they touched a nerve in the, right down in the community, and I do think they've been implemented. I agree with Lois, though. We, we're a long way away from getting it all done. For example, here in Virginia, though, something happened. We were talking about recidivism and the, uh, you know, the revolving door for criminals. We we uh, abolished parole here in the state of Virginia, and it, I know that the the violent crime has gone down. We've got a we've got a an exile program for anybody that's that's found guilty of uh, using a firearm in the commission of a felony and. I think the idea that not only are we helping victims, but we're getting tough on criminals, and, and the, that's the flip side of, of, of this report. So I do believe that we are seeing uh, implementation, but we are a long way away from getting it. And like anything good, you have to bring it back again. And I would certainly be in favor of re-releasing this report with some other uh, recommendations uh, because we need to refresh the new people coming in, as you said, into law enforcement and into the judiciary. Oh, Great, and we will make sure that that recommendation goes to OVC. Oh, um, I need to ask, uh, um, and, and uh, General Eikenberry, you sort of took the jumped right in on the constitutional amendment. As you all know, the uh, federal amendment, your final recommendation, has not yet reached fruition. It was first introduced in 1991, and pretty much every Congress since then. We have passed 33 state constitutional amendments to which Judge Haight referred, and what I really want um, is some good advice from you pioneers um, on how we can implement this darn federal constitutional amendment for victims' rights. Advice to the field. And General Eikenberry, we're going to start with you. Well, first of all, I like the language the task force proposed because it's simple, it's short, it's straightforward, and its implications uh, go to all of the problems that we've been talking about. So uh, I would prefer to stick with that. And that is what we started with in the state of Washington when uh, we had, uh, as Attorney General, we requested this uh, legislation for a constitutional amendment in our state. And in the process, we had to uh, make some concessions in order to get uh, overcome concerns about cost and, in order to, and other concerns, particularly the, uh, the criminal defense bar. And uh, but we ended up with a, an amendment that does can definitely convey uh, convey rights, and it's the basis for uh, an advocate <clears throat> coming forward and challenging uh, instances where those rights are not granted. So I would simply uh, suggest the answer is to keep on keeping on. <laughs> that uh, you know we're we're what we're dealing with is the inertia of uh, oh several. First uh, Bill of Rights amendments that were invoked because our forefathers saw the abuses under the system of when we were under the domination of Great Britain, and so those were all addressed. And we had no, they had no reason to suspect that victims would become so uh, remote and merely uh, like tangible pieces of evidence uh, to prosecutors in the year two, 2003. So we have to keep after it. That's all. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Judge Haight? You know, the one, and I agree with Ken on the original language. I think it's excellent, and I'm in favor of this now. But the only issue is it says, likewise, the victim in every criminal prosecution shall have the right to be present 
and to be heard at all critical stages of judicial proceedings. You know, many places they have a right to be present, but nobody tells them when it's going to happen. <laughs> be notified. I'm always asking here in court, when did you notify the victim that they could be here? Well, sometimes I find out that they sent the letter the day before the hearing. So, I mean, I think there's some logistics and some practicalities to work out, but I do think the language is simple, straightforward, and meaningful that we originally had, and I agree with it. Right. Thank you, Lois. And just a, a point from here, we actually, the National Constitutional Amendment Group has gone back to much more basic language, so I, I think that would make you all feel pretty good. Um, General Meese, Constitutional Amendment, why haven't we been able to get that passed? Well, I think because there hasn't been a, a unified effort and to bring it to the attention and to uh, put the pressure on people in the Congress. Uh, one of the things we know is that uh, when there's a general public interest, it gets a lot less attention in Congress than when you have a, a kind of a targeted special interest working on a project. And I think maybe uh, uh, some of the organizations that we've talked about here, NOVA, Valor, some of the others, uh, may need to... Uh, get the ball rolling to, uh, to target and to intensify and concentrate on, on this particular amendment. Uh, and as to what uh, Lois just mentioned, I think perhaps uh, one small amendment so that uh, it would say that the victim in every criminal proceeding or prosecution shall have the right to notice of and to be present and to be heard at all critical stages. That's excellent. Great. Thank you so much, General Meese. Uh, Governor Miller. Constitutional amendment. Yeah, federal amendment. We, it's been introduced to every Congress since 1991. It's gone nowhere. But I think the general's right. There hasn't been a, a concerted effort nor a, a, a singular lobbying effort, but certainly there's been support from the victims' groups. Some of the reticence, frankly, which surprised me, has come even from elements of law enforcement uh, based upon economic considerations. Uh, and, you know, I've had uh, discussions with uh, former colleagues, even in the prosecutorial realm, who don't see the need for a constitutional amendment. Uh, I think that the overwhelming um, uh, importance of it is uh, largely symbolic because a lot of this has occurred on a state-by-state -state basis, but the symbolism is still very important and one that I think should be pursued. It's never going to happen unless there is a, a strong group lobbying it on a full-time basis, essentially, at least through one Congress and with one administration. Uh, but if it's embraced by one Congress or by one administration, uh, then it has the potential of still occurring. Uh, you know, this is Pat Roberts. If I could jump in here on this one. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan said very cogently, he said, in dealing with Congress, it isn't necessary that they see the light, but they feel the heat. Uh, <laughs> if there's no heat, uh, they're not going to do anything. Uh, yeah, the, the, it's strictly, it's going to cost you votes, it'll get you votes. And uh, unless that's made clear, and there's a group out there that says, look, we're going to take you down in the next election if you don't vote for this. There's that kind of, I know that's hardball, but that's the way you play it. If you want a constitutional amendment, there has to be a group that is organized, well-funded, and fighting for this thing, and uh, lobbying Congress. And, and uh, it, I doubt if there's that much opposition to it, So it's, and it's not that expensive, so there's no real reason why it shouldn't get done. But it does have to have a, a constituency that goes for it and stays with it. Uh, it isn't enough to make a report and, and hope uh, people of goodwill will endorse it. It just doesn't work that way. Great. Thank you for that passionate response. I really appreciate that. Uh, Terry Russell, any insights on the federal amendment? I think that um, the only thing I would say is uh, that I think, um, you know, we would want to mount that strong attack, update the uh, results in the 33 states that have passed it, uh, compare those results there from the victim standpoint to the 17 that, that haven't, um, and then get from the victim's words how this has really made a difference for them. One thing we found that things don't really happen in the system unless you really personalize it to how much it makes a difference in, in the uh, eyes and, and then in the life of the victims and so forth. And pick those victims, you know, in the different states uh, where we can then um, have 
the pressure that we've talked about, um, the heat, so to speak, uh, on the members of Congress uh, and, you know, update it that way. That's great. And we actually are working on a project similar to that, Terry, that I'll fill you in on later. Great. That, that gives us some comparative data. Uh, Doris Dolan, any thoughts on the federal constitutional amendment for victims? Uh, no, I think that that has been addressed by the professionals in that field. Um, and I agree with Lois that uh, it should have that minor change there to have real meaning. Um, but I want to ask a question uh, before uh, this um, uh, conference is over. Uh, do you think, or does this group think, that we should add anything uh, to that task force report that we didn't cover before that applies to the current needs of today, such as the security of the United States and use of fraudulent documents? That's a question I have. Hello? <laughs> Anybody have any, is there anything that we missed? I, I think that's uh, coming up on item eight. Oh, we, I, did, you hear, did you hear my question? Yeah, I think we're going to ask a, a similar question, Doris, and in a couple of questions. Oh, good. I just wanted to make sure it was asked. Okay. You know, I'd like to comment one thing. I, I think that the constitutional amendment has some detractors, and I don't think they're those that you, you understand or would expect. I don't think the district attorneys are very supportive of this. No, they're not. A big supporter of the victims' movement, but I don't think they're supportive of this. This is contrary to their issues for plea bargaining, getting cases resolved as fast as possible. I think there's a lot of built-in conflicts here. And so I think that the natural group that you thought would be supportive is not. So whatever group that is going to be supportive, as, they, as everybody has said and so well, is going to have to be organized, and it's going to have to be pretty powerful. And that echoes exactly what I said. Right, right, I agree. Yes, Ken, I can very hear it. There's no question but what the insertion of this uh, ingredient is a challenge to the raw authority of the county prosecutor or the, or the mm -hmm. district attorney, and so I can understand the resentment. And trust me, the judges won't be very supportive. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your honesty, Lois. Thank you. Um, we are actually almost done, and now is, you know, for me, the fun questions. Um, 21 years after your report, there's 32,000 laws, over 10,000 organizations, and a field that a lot of people consider to be very vibrant and necessary and, and fairly successful. And, and the question is, it's not a yes-no question, but did you all ever envision that 21 years ago that your work would lead to something like what we have today to help victims implement their rights and better serve them? Long-winded question, but jump on in. And, and can we start with General Meese on this one? Because I know you sort of were the visionary for a lot of this. Okay. It's... Uh uh, we're talking now about the, this is question eight. This is number seven. Just to okay, I, I'm I got one ahead of you there. That's okay. In terms of the success of the right. field, did you ever envision that? Yeah, uh, I don't think at the time we envisioned quite the uh, the scope and quite the uh, uh, the way in which this would be uh, implemented across the country. I think we were hopeful. Uh, and by the way, when we talk about vision, uh, one person we should not forget is Frank Carrington. Yeah. As uh, uh, I think perhaps more than almost anyone, uh, Frank was, uh, along with Doris, uh, Frank was one of the earliest workers on this uh, when he was with Americans for Effective Law Enforcement way back in the, in the 60s and 70s. And uh, he had a vision, probably as great as anyone's, of uh, what could happen if the victims' movement really got going. And I would say that uh, Frank des deserves a lot of credit for what has happened. Uh, he, of course, was a member of the commission. Uh, and or the task force, and so uh, I would say, but I would say that the recommendations and the work of the com of the task force has succeeded far beyond uh, anyone's uh, hopes or or beliefs at the time. Right, I, I appreciate that, um, Governor Miller. What are your thoughts on 21 years later? Well, I think the fact that we are together and discussing it is a remarkable achievement in and of itself, but it still has that kind of interest and viability and that speaks volumes. 
as far as whether it reached as far uh, to the scope that we had predicted, I don't know that anybody could predict, but I certainly think that the hope was there. And personally, I had the expectation that it could reach a national level because national organizations like the District Attorneys Association, which obviously has had the concerns with the Constitutional Amendment, but still embraced the other components like the National Organization Victim Assistance and, and like the other entities that were brought in by the scope of the task force, were there and in place. And it was the time had come, the place was there, and, and fortunately President Reagan and Ed Meese and had the foresight to, to move forward on it. Uh, and so I, I really had the hopes that it would reach the, the audience that it has. And uh, hopefully it, it continues to be a, a living document. That's great. Thank you so much. Dr. Robertson. I think that it has exceeded any of our expectations, in my opinion. Uh, I, again, uh, say the thoroughness of the staff work and the uh, uh, chairmanship of uh, Lois in this regard were very significant. But I, I don't believe that any of us thought that just a one more report, they usually are in dusty file cabinets, but to see the life and vibrancy of this report and the effectiveness of it, it to me is remarkable. And I, I again, am quite surprised. I, I, we, we all thought we were doing something good for victims, but nothing of the scope that it, uh, it, it turned out to be. And the fact, again, we're here this many years later and saying, let's, let's release it again for, for one more shot at the, at the public, I think is quite extraordinary. That, that is extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, Terry Russell, please. I agree. I think that, um, you know, I certainly didn't expect this much, but I did have the expectation that this could really make a difference. Uh, I mean, I think from the standpoint of the time, uh, the timing of it uh, and, and the different groups that were getting involved, I think when you – I had been um, – an assistant U.S. attorney for 10 some years uh, at that particular point in time, and, and I knew so well how poorly victims were being treated, uh, virtually as a piece of evidence, inanimate objects that you just move from place to place. And uh, I knew, I, I thought the time was right for that to be changed, and I think that the strategy that was employed to do that, and I think the a key also was following up on it, and, and I think that. Uh, uh, a key point there was when Lois became um, Assistant uh, Attorney General in charge of the Office of Justice Program and establishing the Victims of Crime Office there in the Justice Department and, and the grants that went through and the leadership that uh, occurred there I think was very important in, in moving this forward. Uh, uh, the only other name I haven't heard mention, I don't think, who uh, was important in helping them to write the report and uh, was Carol Corrigan and I think uh, she was uh, tremendous in helping uh, to put this together. Great. Thank you for, for that recognition. Uh, Doris Dolan, did you have any idea the field would be big and successful today? Uh, yes, I did, because I could see the need, and you know how many years I've worked with it, so I could see people start to wake up, and this task force, I think, brought it to the forefront even more than any of the other things we did because it was on a smaller scale and this had the impetus because it came from the President of the United States and it was national. So it, it started the movement uh, and uh, when you say how many organizations are helping, it's unbelievable uh, because when uh, we knew this at the beginning, we couldn't even get anyone to go testify in legislation, anyone to accompany a poor victim to court. You couldn't get anything. Now you have these organizations that people are helping. And I think that's the wonderful thing about this whole this whole task force. Great. Thank you so much. It's a compliment to each of you for sure. Um, General Eikenberry, 21 years later, what do you think? I wouldn't have guessed uh, at the outset how uh, pervasive would be the results of our report and uh, the whole victims' rights movement as an example uh, of something that occurred in our state, and I think it's probably representative of most states. In 1986, uh, the Office of Attorney General published a guide to crime victim services, and it was based on a survey sent out to all these different institutions and the remarkable thing is that they sent them back with uh, indications, for example, here's one fire department that do, says they do investigation, prosecution, witness preparation, and accompaniment to, to court, 
witness notifications, and on and on and on, research, influencing public policy. And we have, this is in tiny mouse print, runs on for 103 pages, and it covers almost every community in the state, listing trauma centers, uh, hospitals, counseling at services, and so forth. So I think that uh, this is simply one piece of evidence of how expansive and pervasive our, our work has been. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm sitting here with Diane Alexander, and we're both laughing at. Um, I just I don't know if you all realize that that little book is it's it's considered worth its weight in gold in our field, because there aren't very many left, and and it really was the foundation for everything that has followed since then. So I needed you to answer that question before I could say thank you, thank you from the bottom of our field's heart, because we I we're convinced we would not be where we are today without that document. No question. That's good to hear. Yeah. Really, really, really thank you, thank you. And th my last question, and, and and also any final remarks any of you have, I really, there, there's such incredible uh, passion and expertise among the task force members. There are a lot of young uns today who don't know you folks, and they don't know about the task force report. Now they will because of this project. What advice can you give uh, to victim service providers today, people who interact with victims. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the Honorable Lois Haight. Well, listen, I get to answer seven first. Okay. Oh, you didn't get to answer seven? I didn't get to answer seven. And I think it's a, uh, I, I want to say you asked, did we ever envision that this would happen? Yeah. And I have to say it was a prayer answered, that we thought we could make a difference with victims of crime we just never dreamed it would make this much of a difference. Oh. And I want to tell you that one of the biggest thrills of my life uh, when I was appointed assistant attorney general, when the president said, I want you to uh, fulfill those recommendations. <laughs> and I remember calling Terry Russell and go, Terry, they want <laughs> us to implement those recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> And you did. How, is that fabulous? Anyway, another thing I think should be said in that regard is each one of these members on the task force brought back this into their own lives and spread it out in their fields. Ken Eikenberry in Washington and Bob Miller, who was DA and then became governor of Nevada and did such a great job. Each one of these people came back to their own places and, and just tripled and quadrupled it. So I think that there's a lot of credit to go around, and certainly to each one of the task members that didn't just sit back. And Pat Robertson, I was on your show three or four times personally, sure. and I know you went into this field so well with not only these victims and victims of family violence. So I just think a great credit goes to those. Um, Twenty-one years later, if I was able to offer advice to victims, uh, you know the number one is be vigilant to victims' providers. Be very vigilant with what's going on in your counties. Watch your courts. Sit in your courts. Talk to your DA. Talk to the law enforcement. Find out what's going on because so many, uh, as has been mentioned, people change, things go on, new people come on board that have no idea. I think to be very vigilant of what's going on and to keep fighting because it's not over. Oh, thank you, Lois. Thank you so much. Um, General Meese, what's your advice to the field today? Well, one of the things that I think was very important, uh, and this goes back to what I was saying earlier about the need to continue to educate people, uh, I think that the training programs that Office of Victims of Crime have had in the past for uh, people involved in victim service providing and justice professionals uh, should be continued. Uh, I think it's been very good. Uh, I participated in a number of these over the last several years, and I think uh, it has uh, two major benefits. One is to continue to pass on the information that's necessary, but secondly, to show the people who are involved in uh, victim services that there are people like them all over the country that are enthusiastic, innovative, and creative. And so I, I would say this is one of the most important things that could happen uh, to perpetuate and, and uh, uh, add to the progress of the movement. Uh, thank you, General Meese. And the National Victim Assistance Academy will be at its 10th year is this year. So. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, thank you for that. I will make sure OVC hears that. Um, Governor Miller, advice to the field, please. Sensitivity. I think that that's the bottom line to all of the recommendations. Uh, try and place yourself 
in the position of the person who has been victimized. And if you were they, what would you want? What would you expect? Uh, and I, as to the victim themselves, uh, I think assertiveness. Uh, they are not to be expected to know all their rights, uh, but they should go in with an attitude that they have some and that they are going to exercise them by asking questions and desiring to participate. Great. Thank you so much, Governor Miller. Dr. Robertson, please, advice to the field. I somewhat echo the government's, uh, governor's sentiments. Uh, we need empathy. We need compassion. We need to remember that these people are not statistics. They are human beings. And, again, to empathize with their hurt, uh, their financial plight, uh, the uh, effect on their families and on their health and all the, the surroundings, I think that is the most important thing when we deal with it. Otherwise, we can get cold, we can get professional, and, and again, treat them like, like ciphers, like, like uh, statistics instead of human beings. Wow, thank you so much for that. Uh, Terry Russell. Um, I'd just like to add, I think a key thing here is to stay victim-focused. Uh, I think one of the, the um, brilliant things of the, of the task force in this was to take a look at the equation that was being utilized in this whole area. Uh, before this, it was seen as the defendant on one hand, who was usually poor, frequently minority, without uh, a lot of su support, uh, although, of course, there's you know, a number of procedures there to support him, but nonetheless, and on the other side was the, the government the all resources available and, and so forth. And, and when the equation was seen as that, frequently the defendant won out. And in particular, in, in many legislators where you have defense counsel and so forth, it was extremely difficult. Uh, our inability to change the Bail Reform Act, which put the burden on the prosecution uh, in bail cases, uh, was very important in this revolving door of justice that was out there so much. And what changed was to say, you know, it, it wasn't the state, it wasn't the federal government against the defendant. It was really the victim. I think there was a rape victim who said, look, I was the one who was raped, not the state of, was it North Carolina, I think? Virginia. <laughs> yeah. The um, state of Virginia. Okay, Virginia. Um, and and putting, the, putting the equation in, in that context changed everything. And I think as we move forward um, in victim services, in addition to being vigilant, uh, which was pointed out, I think the key is to stay victim-focused. Well put, Terry. Thank you. Doris Dolan, advice to the field. Uh, the advice to the field, um, I have these two things here, the Victims Crisis Center, and um, we have a tremendous um, uh, establishment here in the medical field and the place uh, that trains nurses from all over Texas, just as an example. I would like to make copies of the Victims Crisis Center, and when they are training nurses, I think it would be wise to put this into their hands and have someone speak to the subject uh, so that they, as you say, the next generation that's coming up is aware of what they can do uh, in the emergency room or wherever they may be, um, and what companies can do. You know, we've kind of, um, we can make use of companies uh, to help victims too. So I'm going to see what I can do about having the printing of these two brochures because it covers that field and would enhance what the task force has recommended. Well, I appreciate that, Doris, and we'll work with you on that. I appreciate that a lot. Ken Eikenberry. Well, the advice I would pass on is that if a person uh, is to become an advocate or to be an effective advocate in this field, I really think they've got to do everything possible to walk in the shoes of the victim. I know that's what was happening on the task force, and this is what happened in our own hearings in Washington State. And if, uh, I'd like to presume on you to read two sentences that appeared in the report about victims. Uh, one of the witnesses said it is hard not to turn away from victims. Their pain is discomforting, their anger is sometimes embarrassing, their mutilations are upsetting. Victims are vital reminders of our own vulnerability. And so while we think it should be easy to sell 
the problems that they have, we actually all think we have the right stuff that we wouldn't be in those circumstances. And uh, it's essential to get over that point uh, to in selling anything from the constitutional amendment to uh, local service, I believe. Wow, thank you. Um, that's all the questions I have. Judge Haight, did you have anything you wanted to... Um, I guess I'm turning the gavel back over to you and see if there's anything you want to conclude with. You know, Anne, I'd like to thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank you for your consistent interest in victims of crime and the many changes you've brought about. You have just been fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> just been wonderful. And the changes you personally are making and the vigilance you are showing and the sensitivity and intelligence with which you are treating it, we're very fortunate to have you following along uh, doing the wonderful work you're doing. So really, I just want to thank you very much. I uh, thank you, and I feel like I have these giant footsteps to, to, to follow after listen, listening to all of you today and all of us being so inspired by your words. And um, I, I guess I want to conclude by saying we are going to be publishing – uh, an OVC special bulletin that I'll make sure everyone gets a copy. And if you end up hearing yourself quoted in different articles and speeches, it will emanate from this project. Our whole goal was to get your uh, wisdom and wit and advice out to the field, and we more than succeeded with that today. And I'm very, very grateful to each one of you for your participation. This is Ken Eichendorf. Can I make a comment Thank to uh, Jim Can. Kate? I'd just like to say, uh, Lois, that while uh, the relationship on the task force was one that made me look on you sort of like a, uh, a favorable den mother. Uh, I, I would just bet and nickel that in your courtroom you run a tight ship. So <laughs> congratulations. And, and I take good care of the victims. Lois, I wish you were on the Supreme Court. We need you. I wouldn't get to see victims then. <laughs> but she will be. And uh, Lois, I don't know if she told you all, but she was elected. Cal um, she was uh, one California Judge of the Year this year. Well, she should be on the well, Supreme Court. You we're really know. proud of her for that. <laughs> thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to end the conference call from this end. I can't thank you enough for participating. Diane, could we ask one question? Of course you can. Uh, uh, is this going to be uh, come out in some sort of a document? Yes, yes, Jeremy. It's going to be a um, PC special bulletin. You know, like their little eight-page, um, sort of a newsletter format. Okay, and I assume we'll get copies, right? We'll get copies, and we will also be. Um, we're also going to be uh, putting this online as the oral history project uh, proceeds, so that people could actually go online and listen to your conversation of today. Well, that's great. Thank you very much for doing this. So we're very, very excited, and uh, we're just glad we were able to get all of you together today. I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Ann. Okay. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.